That music was the perfect piece to bridge us into part two, Corals in Peril. In peril. So you may look at these two photos and you may think that they're both very beautiful. And I would agree, they both are very beautiful, but they're not the same. So one of these reefs is very healthy and the other is very sick. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about coral health and the state of the reefs today. But first, everybody needs an Earth Science 101 refresher. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Earth's greenhouse and the, the role that it plays in uh, coral health, actually. So this is our beautiful Earth. We're all on it. Outside of it, we have an atmosphere. And inside the atmosphere, there's actually greenhouse gases. And they're naturally there, and they're very important. Without the greenhouse gas, our, if we had too much of it, we'd just burn up. And if we had too little of it, we'd be freezing. So greenhouse gases are made up of water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitric so nitri nitrous oxide. OK. OK. So what happens? We also have a sun, and it has rays. And those sun rays come into the Earth, and some of them are reflected off of our atmosphere. And some of them penetrate in, and they stay in, and they actually warm us up. So what's happening today? What's happening today is that we're having increased CO2 levels. So a reminder that CO2 is one of those greenhouse gases. And I told you that if there was too much greenhouse gas, we burn up. And that's kind of what's happening. So looking through here, this is 1750 all the way through to 2010. This loop here is the Industrial Revolution. And we are looking at CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So what you see is that it's going, going, going. And then since the 1970s, it's been an exponential increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. And believe me and thousands of other scientists, it's us. So what does that mean? It means it's getting hot out there. And it's also getting hot for corals. And one of the things I didn't tell you is that corals live within about one degree centigrade of their thermal maximum. So really, one degree centigrade sounds like not a lot. You know, we have a one degree centigrade all the time. But that's, the difference is, is that corals don't really modify their physiology as far as like, they can't really like sweat or do things that like change the temperature. So essentially, as the water changes the temperature, you can think of that as being like a fever. So if the water gets too hot, it's like the coral's blood and everything else is too hot. So they essentially have a fever. Um, so this is looking at a map from where corals live. Reminder that they live 25-ish, 25 north to 25 south. So that's what we got here. And these are, this is the amount of warming that's happened from the mean from 1970, or sorry, 1988 to 2007, minus the mean from 1950 to 1969. So what that means is that areas that are redder have warmed up more, and areas that are orange have warmed up a little. Areas in uh, yellow haven't really done anything, and blue means that they've actually cooled off a bit. But when you look across significant space, which us scientists are obsessed with, what it looks like is about 62% of the ocean is warming, while only 2% is cooling. So really, this global warming phenomena, it really is warming up the oceans, and specifically where corals live. So what happens, I'm sure you've all read in the news about coral bleaching. So this is what happens when it's too hot. And actually, it's what happens when corals pretty much do anything. It's too much anything, and then corals bleach. Um, if you didn't get a chance when you came in to see corals in action, um, we have some coral tanks at the back that my lovely graduate students have put together for you. So be sure to stop by those tanks. They'll be hanging out by there to tell you a bit about the corals that we have. Um, there's white ones and brown ones to mimic bleaching. So you'll be able to see the difference with and without the algae. But what happens in coral bleaching is just that. This is a healthy coral. It has its symbiont in its in its um, gastroderm, nerdy science talk, but inside its cells where it can give the carbon sugars to the host, the coral. And when that carbon sugar source disappears, so when the symbiotic relationship is lost, that means the coral's lost its food. So it's essentially starving to death. So that's what's happening here. So corals, a bleached coral doesn't necessarily mean that it's dead, because corals are just like jellyfish. They're actually really clear, um, and the color comes from the symbiont. So it's that loss of symbiont that makes it turn white, but a white coral doesn't really mean that it's dead. Usually dead corals on a reef don't look like the ones that I gave you. They look like this. They look like they're covered in macroalgae because there's nothing left. So all these other things start colonizing on top of them. So, but one thing to note is that a coral can be bleached, and it can actually recover, so it can go the opposite way. Um, but this is what it looks like in real life. So this is a healthy coral, these are bleached corals, and then these are dead corals. So you can quickly tell the difference between a bleached coral and a dead coral. Although the ones you have look like bleached corals because nothing's growing on them, but it's just because they're skeleton. 
So I have this really cool video that I stole from the internet on coral bleaching. And this is what we're seeing today on reefs. Really widespread bleaching. So this is what the Great Barrier Reef looked like as far as bleaching. So red means that you bleached and green means that you didn't. Um, so in 2016, the upper Great Barrier Reef bleached very severely. Um, many reefs experienced what they called 99.9% .9 bleaching. And that led to a lot of death. Um, so really 99.9% .9 means that we just put that 0.1 in there just in case we missed something. Um, and then this is what 2017 went, so we had the middle barrier reef get hit really hard. So this is back-to-back -back bleaching episodes, and this is not normal. Um, so, you know, back, back in my undergrad days, you know, there was the 1998 bleaching event, and it was well known to be a bleaching event, and there wasn't another big one until 2005. But now we're seeing back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back every year, the same reefs are experiencing bleaching, bleaching, bleaching every year. So it doesn't even give them a chance to recover. And this is what's predicted. So this is what's predicted for the 2030s. This is looking at the percentage of, of reefs that bleach. And this is looking at the 2050s. So red means that 91 to 100% of, of reefs will bleach in that area. So it's looking pretty dismal for coral bleaching. So now I'm going to tell you about problem number two. So just when you thought CO2 only caused one thing, which is increased temperatures, I lied to you, it caused a second. So this is, now we've zoomed in from 1955 to 2015, and this is looking at that atmospheric PCO2, so that amount of CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere. Um, what I also want you to know is that CO2 can actually come into the ocean, and so it dissolves into the ocean and becomes PCO2, so it increases the PCO2 of the ocean, and that drives down pH. Oops. That was weird, sorry. Um, drives down pH, and what that means is called ocean acidification. The ocean is becoming more acidic. And what is it doing? It's causing corals to not be able to calcify. Ocean acidification means that corals no longer have enough, enough car calcium carbonate to, to actually calcify. So this is, look, this is work from Ann Cohen from Woods Hole. This is at normal conditions. This is one of those baby corals. And then this is next century. So you can already start to see the skeleton not being as strong, 2,500, which is pretty extreme. And then this one's totally ridiculous. But essentially, you can just acidify away the skeleton. Um, this is some realistic work we did in the Castillo Lab at UNC North Carolina. Um, or UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, this is at control conditions, you see a nice thick skeleton. And this is under acidic conditions, you start to see that the skeleton's becoming very skinny, very tall, and very ornate. So we're seeing that corals are becoming more delicate. So this is a big problem because th the other thing we know about climate change is that it's causing more severe storms. With our corals becoming more delicate, th these are big problems. And this is the predictions for ocean acidification. Again, um, anything in red means bad. So ocean acidification happens worse at the poles, but you'll see it starting to creep into the tropics. And the really dark red color means it's an aragonate saturation state of one, which means anything below that, nothing calcifies, period. So it's um, not as bad as ocean warming, and we know that. We know that the number one threat to corals is the warming part of um, increases in CO2, um, but ocean acidification is also a problem. And these obviously don't happen one or the other. You get them both at the same time. So you have ocean warming at the same time as ocean acidification. So this was some work done out of Australia in 2007 predicting what the oceans are going to look like. What is a reef going to look like when we consider how acidic and how hot it's going to get for them? So this is what it looks like with one degree centigrade increase and today's, essentially today's PCO2. This is what it looks like at about 100 ppm higher and another degree centigrade higher, so two degrees centigrade. You'll start to see that there's still corals, but they're not very happy and there's a lot of macroalgae. 
And then this was kind of the grim picture of what we picture might be with three degrees centigrade increase um, and another 100 ppm. So really, these, this combination of ocean acidification and warming is something that we really need to think about. And just to convince you that corals are very sensitive, this is um, Discovery Bay, a beautiful reef in Jamaica in 1975. It's in black and white because it's a long time ago. Um, and this is what it looks like in 2013. So all of those staghorn corals are gone. This was one of the fundamental reef builders in the Caribbean. Nothing, they're gone, nothing's there. This is Carysfort Reef in the Florida Keys. Um, all these Elkhorn corals, um, really reef building corals, like what we think of to be really important for ecosystem function. Um, this is a reef our lab actually works on, and this is what it looks like today. So really all of the coral is mostly gone. And if you want just a personal story about how sensitive corals are, this was one of my most favorite reefs I ever visited. This is the south tip of Yap, um, which is an island in Micronesia, which is kind of by Guam. And this is what it looked like in 2009 when we went to sample. It was my favorite place. Um, it's totally free of other human influences. People in Yap very much care for their reef. Um, there's no, they fish, they do like selective fishing. They're doing all the right things. Um, but this is what the reef looked like when I went back in 2010. Everything was dead. So, with that.